Tech Trade Series and the Tech Trade Classic coming up on Friday. Man, I think that they're they're just a surprise to play every year. Just to add a little bit of intrigue and looking out for the viewer. the number of the tent like the canopy if you can and let's go to the next tent
Ну, то есть, типа, ну, на сколько времени с тебя уйду? Спрашиваешь, if people talk to you or write to you, add one qualifier. The one who is with you tried to do so, they were dead. While faith the walls of Jericho held, after the army had marched with them for seven days. By faith the prophet who was, because he welcomed the spy, was not killed with those who were with him. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to talk merely about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Solomon and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised except the mouth of Moses, who kept the seal of the covenant and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in body and hated foreign enemies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were killed, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better burial. Some faced jeers and scoffs, and even stones and rocks. They were put to death by stoning, They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and afflicted. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the earth. They were all commended to God as dead, yet none of them received what was promised. Since God had promised something much better for them, so that only together with their faith would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. <coughs> and you all be seated. Let's just kind of learn here. You all bring stuff up. Let's just learn. It's just straight from the lectern, you know, just like opening. I think as I said, the the Bible seems to highlight all the different sort of kingdoms of faith that people went through. There's something about that time that that is kind of common to us all. It's it's different from the faith of like the one who didn't have faith, the one who just like did not have faith. It seems like that. And I, I feel like this is something that's like. It's super cool, right? Because it goes past the parts that we just sort of like forget about, right? Like the 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 stuff that like we just like we feel like we just like forget about. There's also verses in here that I love about those who are persecuted and those who suffer and those who endure for the promises of God, right? And so there's a line in the psalm, um, though they fall, they'll never know defeat. And I feel like that's just in my head this entire week. Right? The sense that yeah, in the Christian walk, it's the the, the falling is not. It's a chance to identify with Christ who goes to the cross, right? It's a chance to understand Christ and his suffering. It's a chance to be one with him in those places that are difficult, right? And so, yeah, I hope you enjoy the song. We haven't actually done it live at church, so I feel like that was... <laughs>
15. Uh, I was uh, thinking about what I would talk about for communion and this idea in this phrase that you're not perfect came to mind. Not a perfect person, not a perfect husband, not a perfect child, not a perfect Christian. And we're not a perfect church. We're not. And I think there's a lot of things that come into our minds and into our hearts. And we try to, and we are fooling ourselves when we think that, no, I got, I got everything figured out. Our church has everything figured out. I want to tell you right now this morning, we do not have anything figured out. But we have one thing figured out. It's that we love God. We love because he first loved us. And even though we, we try and we fall and we fail, as Chris was talking about, we fall and we fall and we fail. We're not perfect. But we believe in Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. And so this morning, I welcome all of us here to the communion table. Warts and all, imperfections and all, failures and all knowing that the blood of Jesus Christ has covered over all the sin and brokenness, the shame and guilt that we store up in our lives, all the doubts that we feel, all the disappointments. We're not perfect. No one's perfect. But we believe in a God who still loves us. A perfect love. A perfect God. And so we come to the communion table to receive with joy and celebration, with our limps and our bruises and everything else. So uh, let's take the communion together. On the night in which our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup represents my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat the bread and drink the cup. We celebrate Christ's death and resurrection from now until he comes again. So come, ask God to search your heart. When you feel ready, come and share this communion with all of us.
community table with many open, but uh, for the last song, would you please join me with the song for worship? <laughs>
resurrected from the grave, Lord. You're the God who comes and brings forth new kingdom and goodness and life that brings all that. But God, at the same time, Lord, you're also the one who went to Jerusalem, right? who went to the cross of Palmyra. Right? And so just in that tension, right? standing between both what seems like defeat but also victory, we're being called to usher that the kingdom is here and yet also that we're called to carry out our crosses daily. God, would you just let us live in that tension? Right? Find, find you in the middle. And so I think for today, Lord, um, pray with Pastor Bastian as he preaches the word. Uh, open our ears, open our hearts, and draw us into your kingdom. And before take a seat, say hi to somebody. <laughs> That's the gain on this thing. Was feedback gain going to come in here? Gain here? Um, in here, yeah. Right here. Morning. It's dark in here, is it? It's okay? You guys okay with this? I might fall asleep if it's this dark. <laughs> Thank you, Will. Okay, yeah, it's even darker. <laughs> uh, good morning. It is so good to be back here. Um, shout out to the worship team. I'm so blessed by your guys' sacrifice, your devotion, your skill this morning. Man, the sound is so good. Shout out to Wade and Glennie holding down the fort on Zoom and doing the slides. Thank you so much. This is, it's great to just be able to come and to sit and to worship with all of you. It's, it's really a blessing. So thank you guys. Um, and with that, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been worried sick? Have you ever been worried sick? Uh, you know, as a student growing up, I got worried sick over the big exams, midterms, big projects. I don't know about you, but our, our college was pretty it was a pretty uh, stressful atmosphere during you know finals week. Maybe you guys are just so smart. It's like, oh yeah, easy, easy, just do it. Pass, get A, get paid. No, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But I used to get really stressed over um, you know midterms and exams. I remember one time in college, um, I was cramming. You know, it's like the night before you're cramming. And I was so stressed out that I would not wake up in time for my 8 a.m. final that I chugged a bunch of water right before I went to sleep. I chugged so much water, like a, one of those larger, normal, like plastic water bottles. I chugged the whole thing. I'm like, all right, this will wake me up in the morning. I'll have to like go to the bathroom and not miss my final. <laughs> totally backfired though, because I drank so much water that my stomach hurt. Plus, I was stressed out, and the combination of the two, I got no sleep the night before my final. Still passed, though. It was good. <laughs> um, so, I mean, when you're a student, you get worried over those things. But when you get out of school, what happens? What do you worry about after that? The things that really make you worry sick. You know, when I was a younger adult, I worried about sillier things, like if my sports team was winning the championship. <laughs> uh, but now, as a parent, I worry over little things. Oh my goodness, what did Caleb get into this time? All the little things that they climb on, the things they put in their mouth. Uh, I'm in that stage of parenthood. Um, and it, it really stresses you out a lot. And you get worried sick. And we all know that worrying is not good for you. Physically, right? It's not good for you. Mentally, it's not good for you. But literally, you can become worried sick. Some of you might be familiar with this. Do you know the symptoms of when you're overly worried all the time. What happens to your body? What do you think? What are the symptoms to you? Let's try to think. What do you think? Maybe like one or two symptoms. <laughs> you sleep less maybe. Yeah, you sleep, your sleep isn't as good. What else? What do you think? Diarrhea. <laughs> TMI on QRE, TMI. <laughs> uh, I'll show you because I looked this up. Researchers have found there's more than just two symptoms when you get worried sick. There's so many difficulty swallowing, dizziness, dry mouth, fast heartbeat, fatigue, I mean, no diarrhea here, <laughs> headaches, inability to concentrate, irritability, muscle aches, muscle tension. All, all of these things are just symptoms of when someone is overly worried, overly worried. It's called chronic worry. And what, it's, what researchers have found is it triggers something biologically. Um, your nervous system is affected when you're worried 
all the time. Your hormone levels of cortisol increase in your blood sugar, and it releases all of these things that cause you to feel these symptoms. And if this happens for a long enough period of time, it could lead to serious, serious damage to your body. You can be very sick. Your immune system goes down. Digestive disorders. <laughs> Muscle tension, short-term memory loss, coronary artery disease, and heart attack. These are all the symptoms when you're just worried. No one's punching you. You're not getting into a car accident. It's just when you get worried, overly worried. And I think the times that we find ourselves in increasingly are becoming more stressful. With all the information overload that we have on a day-to-day, -day, how worried are you about the state of our country on a scale of one to 10? You don't have to answer. How worried are you about our economy on a scale of one to 10? About your portfolio on a scale of one to 10? <laughs> don't mention the portfolio today. What about global conflict? What about your family? What about your family in Taiwan? Your family in China? It's really, it's really mind blowing what we've lived through the past handful of years, three or six years, give or take. And that's why I think today's passage is, is really a balm for us who don't realize how worried and stressed out we've actually become as our normal. And, uh, you know, instead of following after the wave of the world that is just spiraling out of control, it seems like, leading us to stress out and be worried. I think going to the scriptures this morning, going and opening up the teachings of Jesus will bring us clarity and hope. And that hope is that power for us to get through each and every day. So we're going to pray, and we're going to open up the scriptures this morning. Let's pray. God, I thank you again. I thank you again for this church family for the people here, the people online, the people that you've given to us who are running and walking with you. And so God, I, I do pray for all of us here to have this freedom to come and lay our burdens down this morning. The, the worries and anxieties that are plaguing our minds and our hearts, may we take them off right now and take in your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So we're still in our series church on source we're going to connect that at the end but um, we're just continuing on in luke chapter 12 so last week we talked about greed this week we're going to talk about worry luke chapter 12 verse 23 you can follow along in your in your phone app or you can follow along here if you can read it all right luke chapter 12 22 then jesus said to his disciples therefore i tell you do not worry about your life what you will eat or about your body what you will wear for life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? So if I could really just be a little cheeky this morning, and do you guys know the word cheeky? I've been watching too much Bluey, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's this Australian kids show that's really good. I highly recommend it. Even for people that are not in the toddler phase, watch Bluey. Um, I thought it'd be a little naughty and cheeky this morning because uh, I think I could sum up like half of the message with two words and it's, don't worry. Or I can say it like this, don't worry. Oh, you guys know. Right. <laughs> you do listen to other music, no? <laughs> uh, don't worry, right? You don't have to worry. And it, that's like half the message, guys. So if you can tune out right now and you just take this home, I'm, I'll be like half happy with you already. Um, don't worry. And Jesus goes on. He doesn't just say don't worry, but he explains what not to. And he expands on this idea of not worrying to his disciples. And what I... We're going to go through this part a little bit slowly because <clears throat> I just found this to be so life-giving. Jesus says, I tell you, do not worry about what? Yeah. Your life, what you will eat, about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body more than clothes. When I talked about worry this morning, did you guys get a little bit stressed out? Like, oh, my body is going to get messed up. The, even the talking about being worried can cause us to be worried. <laughs> 
I think it's just so crazy. We are so prone to be worried as people, just normal people. But Jesus says what? Don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about your clothes, what you're going to wear. You know the phrase that says, don't sweat the small stuff? Mm -hmm. I think these are actually huge things. <laughs> your life and your clothes. Um, Jesus is saying something very counter counterintuitive to that, at least that saying. He's saying, don't sweat the big stuff. Don't, don't even sweat the big stuff. Don't even worry about your life. What's bigger than your life that you can worry about? Name two things that are bigger than your life, right? What about your clothes? If you don't have clothes, that's going to be a pretty big worry, right? If you have no clothes, how are you going to go outside? <laughs> how are you going to interact in society? You need clothes, and you need life. These are the two biggest things, almost essential things. And Jesus says, do not worry about these big things. Do not worry. Like food, clothing. You know, thinking about Jesus' audience, who he's actually talking to here in the scripture, he's not just talking to, like, Silicon Valley engineers, teachers, accountants. He's not talking to these people. He's talking to regular biblical era people, not overly wealthy, not overly powerful, not overly influential. They were probably ordinary citizens, right? Working class, ordinary people. And so their worries, thinking about that group of people, Jesus' audience, their worries were not like, oh, they ran out of organic produce at the market. They're not thinking <laughs> that. Or, you know, how long is the wait for this restaurant? I waited one hour yesterday for boba. <laughs> My blame lives. This <laughs> <laughs> <It's> is cousins. <laughs> they told us to go to TPT, Taiwan professional tea. They're like, oh, it's so good. You know, the most authentic boba from Taiwan directly. And I'm like, all right, sure, let's go. Liz, we were going there, and then, you know, the boys are napping in the car. I'm like, okay, Liz, you go get it. There's so many people <laughs> here. And then there's so many people waiting for their drinks after they order. And I'm like, it can't be that bad. One hour later, <laughs> still there. I saw one car accident in the parking lot. <laughs> I'm like, dude, we've been here so long. The tea was, it's all right. Is it one hour good? No, it's not. Anyways, why am I talking about that? Food. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Jesus' audience was not complaining about waiting for boba, right? They were just trying their best to provide for themselves, their family, their, their community. They weren't worried about, you know, is this in fashion anymore? They weren't about looking cool and hip. Maybe there was a cool sandal back then. I do not know. But they weren't worried about those things. They were probably worried about just the basics. Will I have enough food? Do we have enough clothing? And Jesus is saying, you know, don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat. Don't worry about your clothes, what you're going to wear, because what? don't sweat the big stuff in life. Even though these are the biggest, most basic things that you could worry about, Jesus is telling everyone, don't worry about these things, because life is more than that. Even the things that we could see, the most tangible things, food, clothing, Life is more than that. There's a whole aspect that Jesus actually will go into more. Um, so Jesus continues here. Let me keep going. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. How much more valuable you are than birds. Um, ravens are some of the cheapest birds. You can take my word for it. Um, I'm not sure how historians have figured that out. Um, but if it, you think about it, it makes sense. Ravens are not, like, pretty. Have you seen a raven recently? Yeah? They're, they're everywhere, but they were also in Israel, too. So this is a picture of the fan-tailed raven in Israel. Um, they're not, they're, they're like the cheapest bird. No one cares about ravens. Um, they're not like a cool peacock. Or like a cool parrot that could like repeat after them. And they're not tasty, I don't think. They're not like duck or chicken. 
It's just a bird. It's just a wild animal that probably added little to no value to the community around it. No, no value to the human community around it. And you think about where ravens live. I mean, now we, we see ravens all the time in our yard, eating our fruit. Um, you know, actually one time I saw a raven in our old neighborhood uh, eating roadkill. And then I saw, I think it was a bird actually. So it was a raven eating a roadkill. Anyways, I was like, ah, raven, gross. I, I, I can see that. It's like, ah, Jesus used a pretty good example here because no one cares about ravens. How much more valuable are you? Ravens actually live um, near the Dead Sea in Israel. We, I looked this up on the Raven Bird website. Uh, not Raven Bird website, but the Bird Watcher website for Israel. I'm like, where do you find ravens in Israel? You find them in the wilderness, in the Dead Sea, in En Gedi. I'll show you where it is, right here. All right, this is where ravens are found in the wild. I mean, you can probably find them in the cities and stuff, but this is like their natural habitat. This is where ravens live. And this is really funny because this is En Gedi. If you've been to Israel, En Gedi carries so much significance because that's where King David, not king yet, but David was hiding from King Saul. He hid here in <coughs> the raven's homeland here. And, and so Jesus is saying, I think this is pretty cool. He's saying here that even this worthless, ugly, I'm sorry if I offend anyone who really likes ravens for some reason, but I guess throughout history, no one liked ravens, no one cared for ravens. Um, Jesus said, even this worthly, ugly, no one likes you bird, is able to find food and shelter in the wilderness, in En Gedi, in the Negev, the wasteland. He's, they're able to live because God feeds them. God feeds even the most useless raven. He feeds them, and they can survive because God is their provider. And so Jesus is saying, if God cares for this thing, how much more valuable are you? How much more does he care about the ones he calls made in his own image? How much does he care for you? He keeps going here. Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? Um, you know, thinking about the wildflowers in, in Matthew, it's, it's the lilies of the field. You can, there's a picture of a lily here. Um, you know, I could ask you, who's prettier, you me? this lily, right? <laughs> of course, you're going to say the lily is prettier. And did the lily spend time doing its leaves a certain way, wearing a dressed up whatever thing? The lily does not try, yet it is already beautiful because God clothes the lily. God created the lily. Why? Because God is a creative God. A God who, who upholds beauty in nature. And so Jesus is saying, Look at the worthless bird. Look at the wild flowers that are just living. God is sustaining them. God is feeding them. God is clothing them. Don't sell yourself short. You are much more valuable than a raven. You are much more loved by God than a lily. You are redeemed by the blood, adopted into God's family, and co-heirs with Christ, his own son. And now the Spirit of God dwells within you, giving you power to live that resurrection life. Don't sell yourself short. See, God is able to, and he desires to, take care of you. To take care of you because he, he is your father. We are the children of God. You're not a raven. You're not a lily. I see lily, but you're not a, you're not a wild flower. You're much more than that, right? You're much more than that. Um, and then lastly here, Jesus says, don't worry, why? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Why do you worry? You can't, by worrying, prolong or extend your life. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. If we, if we did, everyone would be worried all the time. We live forever, right? 
but all the effort that we have, all the stresses that we bring on our minds and our hearts, it does nothing to actually solve the fundamental issue, right? That we need God to provide for us. Um, your life really isn't improved by worrying. That's what Jesus is saying here. Why? Because God can do it, whatever it is. Whatever you're worrying about, God can do it better than you. God can take care of you better than you can take care of yourself. God can take care of your children better than you can take care of your children. God's plans, it says in Scripture, God's ways are higher than us. God can do it better than you. We worry, we stress, we plan. It does nothing to improve our life. We can't add a single minute, second to our life. For who holds our life? better than we can. We can do it better than we can. You know, we went through it, you know, worrying only adds negative things to our bodies, right? Diarrhea, stress, no sleep. Um, and it's true, I don't want to sell our healthy choices out because we have a nutritionist in the room too. Um, so eat right, sleep right, take care of your body, right? But even if you eat right, you only eat your homegrown produce. Like you have a farm in your backyard, and you grow it. There's no squirrels anywhere because you've set up traps and you know you perfect produce somehow. Um, you eat that only, and you exercise like two hours a day. Who has time? I don't. But maybe you do that. You 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 eat your you know your organic produce. You go to the gym. You're living a super healthy life. You don't even use a, a smartphone, so you don't have that, you know, polluting your mind. You're like living perfectly according to the way that you should be living. You still don't know how long you have on earth, right? No matter what you do. I was thinking about that, and uh, as I was reminded, I was standing here, we were like two, three years ago now, but we were here on a Sunday before the pandemic. There was a helicopter crash in, in SoCal. Famous world-class athlete, Kobe Bryant, passed away. Helicopter crash, boom. I was describing Kobe Bryant when I said, you have perfect produce, you work out two hours a day. He did everything right. His body was in perfect shape. He had all the money and wealth in the world, and he could not extend his life. His fans could not extend his life even one more hour. He had so much to live for. So much to do is left on earth, but he still could not extend his life. Because why? No one can. You can. I can. No matter how much we love someone, no matter how much we try, we cannot do anything to extend someone's life. Only God can do that. So don't worry. Don't worry. We have to trust that God can do it better than you. God can do a better job of providing, a better job of caring, of loving. And so what does Jesus say in response to this? This idea of worry says this, 29. And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things. And your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. So half the message was what? Don't worry. What's the second half? Be, be, holy. be holy. Don't worry. Be happy and holy. See, we can be people that are not marked by worry. We can be people that are holy. Why? Because we have a good father. We have a good father. Look at this. Verse 30. For the pagan world runs after all such things like food, drink, all these other things of the world. And your father knows that you need them. Your father knows. So you can be holy because your father knows what you need. He knows what you need. I think this is such an awesome truth in scripture. One, that God is our father and that we are the children of God, right? but that he knows what we need. I, I think to 
with what I'm doing, parenting these two little crazy boys. Half the time, I'm just trying to figure out what they need. Half the time. Because they can't really talk well. Uh, well, because I can talk. Caleb is actually fine. I'm trying to figure out what they need. Do they need love? Do they just want a snack? What do they need? I think it's, it's so, um, it's such an awesome truth that God knows what you, what you need in life. He knows because he's our father. And we don't have to worry because our God wants to take that burden from us. That burden of, what am I going to do? What am I going to do about this situation? How am I going to feed this person? How am I going to care for this person? All the big things in our life that consume our thoughts and our minds, God knows what we need. He wants to free us from worry. He wants to release us from the anxieties in our hearts, and he wants us to cast our cares upon him. See, what does the world do? What does the pagan world do? It runs after food, drink, the things of this world. It runs after wealth, power, comfort. But we are free, and we are called to be holy. So what does that mean, to actually be holy? It means to run a different race. See, the world runs one way, and it leads to worry, anxiety, bitterness. It leads to, to greed, as we talked about last week. But God calls us to not run after these things, to run a different race. And what does that look like? To seek his kingdom. Mm -hmm. To seek his kingdom. And that means our measure of success, our victory is not when I achieve some level of comfort, of wealth, of power, of importance. My level of success is not when you know, my children get married or have kids. See, our measure of success as a, as a person, as people who follow after God, our success, our victory, is when the kingdom grows, when the kingdom of God advances, when we see broken lives restored by the love and power of God. See, seek his kingdom, and all will be added. Let me go back here. 31, seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. See, I'm not advocating a prosperity gospel mindset, like pray for what you want, and God will give you the jets. No, I'm not, praying, I'm not advocating for that. But I'm, what we see here is that when people understand who God is and who they are, that you're a child of God, God knows what you need, he's going to take care of you. What does that do? It releases you from the pressure of having to take care of yourself. It frees you to be free from, from anxiety, from worry, from stress, all these negative things that do so much harm to our body. Why? Because God loves you. He loves your body. He wants you to live a healthy life. This is not just for suffering, suffering's sake. He wants you to be free so that you can seek his kingdom, so that you can run a different race, so you can live a holy life. It's that kingdom mindset that we want as a church. Desiring God above all else. Seeking God first. Because when we seek after God, Scripture says you will find Him. If you seek me, you will find me. But if you only run after the things of the world, if you desire the things, perhaps even that God can bring to you, God can do for you, you're going to miss out on God. So it's a matter of the heart, and Jesus keeps going here. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The scripture is so encouraging. And I'm thinking now even to the song, Chris, that you, you led this morning. The kingdom is yours. Right? The kingdom is yours. Hold on a little more. This is not the end. Hope is in the Lord. Keep your eyes on him. It's a truth. It's a true song. The kingdom is yours. Why? Because your father gives you the kingdom. He wants to give you the kingdom. Talk about big stuff. 
He gives you the kingdom. See, we don't have to live like the rest of this world, driven by worry, driven by scarcity, driven by supply chain issues. Our Father knows no supply chain issues, right? He wants to give us the kingdom. Generously give us the kingdom. Earlier in this block of teaching, a couple passages before, Jesus teaches about prayer. His disciples ask him, how do we teach us how to pray? And Jesus teaches, he gives them the, the Lord's Prayer, and he talks about, you know, this, this neighbor that has no bread, and knocks really hard on the door, wakes the person up. And then he says, how much more you evil fathers will give bread to those kids who are hungry, right? If he asks for a fish, don't give him a snake, right? And then he teaches that how much more will our Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? To those who ask. And this is a building on that teaching, that God gives the Holy Spirit to His, his, his children, but he, he gives the kingdom to His children. See, God is a generous God. He gives the Holy Spirit, He gives the kingdom, He gives His presence, He gives of Himself. And we know how this gospel ends. He gives His own Son, to die for our sins. See, our God is a giver. He is a giving, generous God. But then that we hold in tension, right? For all the ways that we find lack in our life. All the ways that we don't see that God is generous with the good things in life. You might think, is God generous? Is he a good father? Is he a giver? If he is, why don't I have the job that I want? Why can't I get that promotion? Why can't I get that house? Or the family or the kids that I want for? Maybe we put God in a box. If God doesn't give me this, whatever this is, that must mean God is not good. Since God did not give me this, then I can't believe that he's good. Oh, pastors such as myself, Pastors, I think Tim Keller probably heard of this, but they, they would say, if that is what you believe, if God doesn't give me this, then he's not good. Then whatever this is, that's the thing that's actually your God. Be it the promotion, the purity, the love, adoration, whatever it is, whatever this is, that's the thing that he placed above God. It's hard to hear. It really is, and I say that with all the gentleness that I can muster, because it's natural. We want good things for the people that we love, right? Right now, um, one of our parenting struggles, uh, during COVID times, uh, uh, Zach, Zachary, our oldest, was like two, three years old, during like the peak COVID time, like a couple years ago. Two, three years old. And two, three, two, age two to three is kind of one of those ages where you want to start bringing your kid out letting them try new things, experiencing the world. And so this whole time, Liz and I were worried. We're like, oh my gosh, he doesn't have any friends. He doesn't know anybody. He just plays with you all day. Oh. And so we're worried, we're like, oh, I'm not a child. I can't give him that childhood friendship thing. And so we tried to sign him up for other classes when things opened up. One of the things we signed him up for was a swim class. Have you seen those videos where they throw the kids in the pool? Oh, you should look it up. It's really funny. John's like, I've done it. <laughs> I'm just I don't know if you've done it. Um, but they take like the, the newborn, they take the toddler, they just chuck him in the pool, and like the kid basically drown swims for a little bit, like, I'm alive, I think. We didn't do that to Zachary, but we did sign him up for swim class so that he could be safe in the pool. And you know, it was it's been a struggle. It's been so hard. He he, he likes the pool sometimes, but most of the time, he really doesn't like it. He really doesn't like the pool. Which is funny, because he loves swimming with, yeah, yeah, the grandpa. And he loves swimming with me. But when we go to the teacher, they go into their pool, he just doesn't want any part of it. And so Liz and I were so stressed out, like, he's never going to swim, and all these <laughs> other things. Um, and one of those things, I, I, even the, the thoughts that came up to my mind, like, oh my gosh, God, if you could just let him go to class, 
I'll believe you are good. <laughs> it's one of those bargains that we make as, you know, people, let alone parents, right? People, if you just do this, you, I will worship you, I will do whatever you want, God, I'll sacrifice my whole life for you. If he just puts his head in the water for one second and comes up, all these silly things, right? We've actually taken him out of swim class. We want him to just have fun. But he can just swim with the air now. <laughs> but um, I think we, we're just all prone to that. We're prone to that, for the, especially for the things that we care a lot about. The things that are super close to our heart desire, things that we work a lot for, the things that we're really invested in, the things that we truly value, we tend to have that mindset, God, if you would only do this, then how good of a God you would be. Jesus teaches us it's backwards. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all of these things will be given to you as well. In, in careful reading of it, it's not just seek, seek his kingdom so that you will get all the riches in the world, right? It's not that. It's you seek his kingdom. What would happen? Seek his kingdom, and then everything else will fall into place in your life. Because God is first in your life. Your marriages will fall into place. Your workplace relationships will fall into place. Everything else will fall into place when you seek God's kingdom first. And see, the children of God, sometimes they're good, Sometimes they're bad, just like regular kids. Sometimes we seek God's kingdom first, sometimes we don't. But we try. We try again. We recognize the good things that God has poured out into our lives because our God is a giver. And we also understand how much we have to offer, right? So anyways, that was a huge tangent, sorry. 32, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions give to the poor. Here's the actual second half of the message. So the first half was what? Don't worry. Be bold. Second part is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Be generous. Don't live like you don't have enough. God is on your side. God is taking care of you. <clears throat> God wants to take care of his children. He's going to take care of you. So all the fears about finances, inflation, job security, prestige, influence. Don't worry about those things. I actually really respect my wife, Liz, because she's gotten to a place in her work where mm -hmm. people can say whatever they want to her. Her boss could do something. She's secure. She knows. She doesn't have to be afraid. She doesn't have to live for the approval of others there. She's no one's slave at work. Why? Because she understands. She understands that God is taking care of her. She doesn't, have to, she doesn't have to worry. She doesn't have to fear. And again, Liz, super generous. All of her coworkers know. All of her family members know. All of her friends know how generous she is. Why? Because. She understands, well, actually her mom, <laughs> her mom was one of the most generous people, always giving good gifts to all of the, all the loved ones around. She follows in her mom's legacy. But she also understands. In scripture, when we are released from fear, released from the fears of this world, we are free to be generous. To be generous as, a, as an individual with our time, our talent, our treasure, selling our possessions, giving to the poor. That is the church, the people that God wants us to be shaped into, who are, who are set free from worry and anxiety, who are set free from fear of not having enough, to be holy and to be generous. That is the church that God wants to build. That's the legacy that he wants to leave. That's the church that I want to build. To be a, a church not worried about the things that are happening around us so much that we become inundated and unable to do anything. No, we are a holy city on a hill, salt in the world. Salt and light in this world. Holy witness to who? To our good Father, who gives to us because he cares about us. And because God's on our side, because he's given us the Holy Spirit, he's given us the kingdom, we don't have 
not to be afraid of anything this world has to offer. Anything that we come against. We don't have to be afraid, especially when it seems like, if I give this, I don't know if I'm going to have enough. If I give this time to the Lord, I don't know if I'm going to have enough. If I sacrifice my 20s, well, I guess I don't know. Uh, if I sacrifice my 20s, don't date anyone in my 20s, I don't know if I'll have a wife. Someone swipes on my profile, even though it says pastor on it. <laughs> Who would do that? I don't know. <laughs> don't be afraid. Be generous. Give of your life. Give of your possessions. To help those around you. Especially in the text that says, sell your possessions. Give to the poor. Um, I want to just wrap this up a little bit. Um, we can do that because we are eternally secure. We have a treasure in heaven, not on earth. Right? I think we all understand that to some level. At the same time, I've said this last week, I've said this a couple of times throughout the year, we're trying to find a place of our own, an earthly building of our own. And I'm always in tension with this because, like, is this a treasure on earth? Are we a church that's just trying to become a club or whatever it is? And I'm always... I have voices in my head talking to me, you know, just, what am I, are we doing the right thing? Are we trying, to, are we going the right direction? And I think that, you know, it was kind of cool yesterday, I was at a parenting conference um, with Liz and the family. We were at this church in the South Bay, in the peninsula. It was a beautiful place. It felt like a, a retreat center, actually. Um, and I was like, wow, what a blessing this is. For the people that go there. It's a blessing for the people that go there. It doesn't give them worldly wealth. It doesn't give them, like, I don't know, good food or whatever it is. But what does it do? It gives them a place to heal their soul. And I, that was really enlightening to me. Actually, I was talking to the pastor there, and he was like, yeah, before we, we kind of grew to fill out the whole building complex that they have, they actually rented out their open space to a counseling center, a Christian counseling center, and a Christian missions agency. So you had a church, you had a counseling center, you had a missions agency, all using worldly treasure to advance the kingdom. So I think here, what I'm trying to get at is, if we are heading in this direction of, you know, we want, we're, we're praying for this, we, we're seeking the Lord to open doors for us to find a home for this church family. Let's go with boldness. Let's go with confidence. Let's not be afraid. Why? Because God is going to provide. God wants to care for us. Sometimes it means you meet in a school. Sometimes it means you have your own building. Whatever it is, whatever God's going to do, we don't have to worry about it. But what do we, what are we called to do? Not just stay by ourselves. Not just make a comfortable life for ourselves. To be holy and to be generous. I think that's really cool. I just needed to see that yesterday that a church would open up its doors to a counseling center. Just to use. Charge, they, he's telling me, we charge super low rent. <laughs> so that after they had to leave, they got mad at us because they had to pay market rate somewhere else, right? He's like, deal with that when you have to deal with it. But um, they were generous with their space. They had a missions agency operating out of there too. I think if we hold on to this thing, that maybe we, we find a place, it's not, maybe it's not just for our church. Maybe it's for people that are also advancing God's kingdom in other ways. Let's be holy. Let's be generous. Let's seek the kingdom above all else. That's the church that God wants to use to advance the kingdom here on earth. So don't worry. Be holy. Don't be afraid. Be generous. Let's live by faith as a church. Let's pray. God, I just I am thankful again. I am thankful that, God, you know exactly what we need. You know better than we know ourselves. So, God, I pray for, for those in this room, myself included, that have been stressed out, that have been worried about the things of this world, the things that we truly care about. Help us to cast our cares upon you. Let us seek your kingdom first together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Have a pure heart of love, always. And just keep your finger. Just your finger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that song. It's a classic. Uh, we have a few announcements here. Um, so next week we're back here. We're not online, but I really encourage you to come because there's a guest speaker who you might be familiar with. Pastor Chris. <laughs> so Pastor Chris will be here next week. Uh, we're going to be back here in Gardner. I hope to see you all back here. Um, he flew all the way from Jersey, so please come if you are here in town. Uh, if you feel comfortable, um, please come. The next week's, uh, the dates are there online. Um, so September we're meeting twice, October we're meeting twice. We're trying to ramp up um, in November, so please pray for us as a church. Uh, pray for God to apply all our needs um, as a church family just to, to, to have church. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's my kid. Anyways, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the lunch boxes, uh, I was told by Auntie Susie this morning that uh, we're doing our tray lunch again, so you, you serve yourself. But if you don't feel comfortable eating lunch here, please feel free to take a to-go box, serve and pack it in as much as you want, take it home. Right? You can take more than one home if you want. Um, just leave a little bit for us here. Um, <laughs> all right. So with that, I think we're we're eating raven this. No, it's gonna be. <laughs> we uh, let's uh, let's pray. Let's pray for the food and let's let's close with the benediction. God, I thank you again. Yes, we want to seek after you. We want to follow you. We want to love you with all that we have. So God, we thank you for your love, God. 
Help us to experience your love, to be encountered by your love through your word and through the gift of this family. Um, so God, we, we thank you for you being our provider. We thank you for the food that we're about to eat. Bless it to nourish our bodies in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Love you. Good job, man. See, everything went smoothly. Yeah. Yes. No, no surprises today. <laughs>